Hey, hey, Marcus House with you here and another incredible week of SpaceX news. Now, if you haven't heard by now, we did sadly lose the SN3 Starship due to a bizarre mishap the other night. Not necessarily an issue with the build itself, but it may turn out to just be the testing process that failed here. We'll talk about that quickly, but looking back at the week for the SN3 Starship is interesting because much of what we've learned will still apply to the SN4 ship already being built. We also had some interesting facts drop with the new Starship user's guide. We had have our new friends Zach and Jesse here to give us a quick update on all things Tesla and another few surprises as well. Now obviously the SN3 Starship was lost in this accident here. It has been quite a disappointing end of the week really with the liquid oxygen tank just crumpling in the middle here. I did a quick rundown of the accident in my video the other day but yes I had huge hopes for this vessel because it just looked so much more robust with the cleaner welds and whatnot. Now the pressure tests all seemed to be going well for the top liquid methane tank but then all of a sudden there was some kind of depressurization event in the lower liquid oxygen tank. It seems that it just just lost pressure all of a sudden and then as soon as it crumples in it just topples over and falls headfirst down onto the ground. As I posted in the previous video here is the sound synced up with the footage to remove the typical audio delay we get from the distance from the camera. So yes, this was quite unlike the much more energetic events with the Mark 1 and Serial Number 1 starships. It seems more now like this may not have been so much a failure of the ship build itself. Elon Musk did quickly tweet afterwards that we'll see what the data review says. This may simply have been a test configuration mistake. Even more recently, we received a tweet storm of information around 48 hours after the incident confirming that this was a test configuration error rather than a design or build mistake. There was not enough pressure in the liquid oxygen tank to maintain stability with the heavy load in the liquid methane tank. Pressurization of that tank was done with nitrogen gas instead of liquid nitrogen, which is what would have been used in the top liquid methane tank. Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut, queried Elon on pressure control systems here, to which Elon replied that a pressure issue will doom the ship and crew, so obviously it is super important to ensure that it's very unlikely to happen. He also said that there are redundant pressure control valves. It's a new system and the SN3 Starship was simply commanded wrong. This is actually great great news because it confirms that the structure will be fine to use for the SN4. Even better though was the next tweet confirming some rumours already out there that SpaceX are going to reuse much of the thrust section here. This is going to save some time and based on other components such as bulkheads and ring segments that we can already see around, I'll bet that the SN4 Starship will be about ready for pressure tests in about two or three weeks time. This is exciting stuff. But let's just rewind here a little and talk about the SN3 during the week because although it is now lost, some interesting parts of it I'm sure will continue on with the SN4. Early in the week the Starship excluding the top nose segment for the moment was rolled out and slowly transported down to the launch site. Another foggy day and we got to watch it emerge from that thick fog like something out of a Stanley Kubrick movie. Beautiful footage though and one thing that is certainly very apparent now is how much cleaner the SN3 looks compared to the previous prototypes. If we zoom in we can really get a good idea of how much better these well are looking. As Elon Musk said, the weld settings on the SN1 were not correct, which of course contributed to a number of issues. Now that we have a structure worthy of flight, the various testing needed to take place. Some of the most critical were of course the pressure tests. These have in the past been let's say problematic so far. Beautiful footage here as the Starship was placed onto the test stand as well. Fairly shortly after this, Elon Musk tweeted some very awesome close-up shots. Looking upwards at the thrust puck structure, we can see a number of interesting things. Firstly, this ram structure here, which we believe tests the appropriate pressures on the lower bulkhead of the liquid oxygen tank, and also the critical thrust puck structure that would have had the three powerful Raptor engines mounted to it. The idea here is to make sure that this structure for future ships will withstand the pressures the Raptor engines will throw at it. Keep in mind that each Raptor is capable of around 2,000 kilonewtons of thrust. 
that is quite a crazy amount. And with these three firing together, that's going to be 6,000 kilonewtons, equaling around a 674 ton force pushing upwards. It's also worth remembering that the thrust isn't always equal, with variations in the thrust as the vessel takes off. Now, I haven't seen any information that tells us an accurate idea of what the SN4 Starship will weigh at takeoff. The SpaceX website currently shows the full production Starship weighing in with 1,200 tons of fuel and 100 tons of cargo. That isn't including the actual dry mass of the vehicle itself. Although this tweet here from Elon is a little dated, it would be interesting to know how close the dry mass is to the current SN3 structure. He says here that by Mark 4 or 5, the dry mass should be sitting around the 120 tons range. Now this was aspirational at the time, so not sure how realistic this is with the current version. If you've seen more recent figures on this, please do share them down in the comments. So yes, based on this, we could imagine the full Starship to be around 1,400 metric tons. Obviously, the full specced out Starship includes three vacuum engines as well, which would be slightly less efficient at sea level. But even if there were six sea level Raptors, that would still not be quite enough to lift a fully loaded Starship off the ground based on those specs. Of course, unless we're in some kind of abort situation, the thrust to weight ratio of a fully loaded Starship does not really need to beat gravity from a standing start. It just needs to provide enough thrust to continue to orbit. That thrust to weight ratio increases dramatically as fuel is burned, so it would only have a low thrust for a short amount of time. A bit of a segue there into all that, but what we want to know here is this. How heavy are the prototype Starships? How much fuel will be contained within? As stated a moment ago, the majority of the mass is in fuel. With no nose cone and no cargo, as long as the full test vessel here is less than that 674 tons or so, then the Starship will begin to rise when the three engines fire up together at full thrust. Of course, SpaceX will want a margin of error there. The engines are not going to run at exactly 100% thrust, and for a short flight there is really no need to have the tanks full to the limits of what the three engines are capable of lifting. Also, SpaceX are going to want at least a comfortable thrust to weight ratio. Based on all this, we're expecting that the propellant tanks will be filled somewhere between one third and one half full. Now, a number of people have argued over the last few months that the Starship should be capable of doing quite long duration flights to high altitudes and return with the Starship. But with only three sea level engines, that does very much limit the amount of fuel that can be loaded, and therefore the Delta V capability would be massively reduced. So this will be interesting to see. We know that the intention is to do a 20 km altitude flight with the unique belly flop landing. Based on some rough calculations, this seems possible based on what we think we know here. Now, if you don't know a lot about the way this belly flop landing will work, I've got a video here that goes deeper into that. And while you're here, of course, please do consider subscribing. There is loads more news coming, not only with Starship, but Starlink and Crew Dragon. I'd love to share all that with you. So yes, something else interesting from within the engine bay with these never seen before legs tucked up underneath. These are actually going to flip out so they sit directly under the engine bay. This is very different to what we saw on the Mark 1 Starship where they were mounted to the outside of the engine bay with covers over the top like this. Now it's quite hard to get a really great idea of how long these legs are at this angle in the shot, but we can assume that there are some insane suspension mechanisms inside to cushion that touchdown. Thanks again to Kimmy here for the amazing renders of the legs. This is just beautiful. And of course, Elon Musk did pick this up saying that this is very close to the current legs design, but that major upgrades are coming with a wider span, longer stroke, and the ability to auto level for uneven ground, or even when the Starship needs to land while leaning into high winds. Now, one of the things I'm not so sure about is how much this new design is going to impact the space for the vacuum engines and also the external cargo space that we've seen before. What do you think? Is this just a temporary setup for the early test vessels, or could this be a design that we're going to see well into the future? Let me know in the comments. Now I just can't wait to see this baby take off. It's going to be a crazy flight. What is going to be more crazy though is the full stack. I just can't wait to see a future where a vessel launching frequently like this is commonplace. With so much bad news in the world right now, this is what inspires us. The engineering involved in the Starship is beyond rapid, just like the engineering involved in creating vehicles that could be used not only on Earth, but other planets as well. The Cybertruck, I swear, is made for Mars. You wait. This thing will end up being 
modified as a Mars Rover airtight with an airlock out the back for sure. The vehicles being made by Tesla really are like spaceships themselves and being electric they can be powered with any source of energy producing electricity. Now speaking of Tesla, Zach and Jesse from the incredible YouTube channel Now You Know are here to give us the latest news on Tesla. I can barely keep up with all the SpaceX news so it's always a pleasure to catch up with the multiple weekly videos from their channel here. Thanks for dropping by guys, take it away. Hey, I'm Zach. And I'm Jesse. And thank you, Marcus, for having this Tesla update on your show. So let's start off by talking about the Model Y. This is the latest car from Tesla, and it's rolling out to its first happy customers in the US and Canada. And we just found out that it has a radar heater, so it should be able to handle uh, snowier conditions better in autopilot. Yep. And this is in addition to the heat pump that we just found out about that'll help the range in colder temperatures. Just a little more background on the Model Y. This is the much anticipated crossover utility vehicle. It is Tesla's latest car boasting a 316 mile top range, 145 miles an hour, and a zero to 60 of 3.5 seconds. And this is an SUV crossover. Deliveries are starting right now with the five-seater configuration, but the seven-seater should be available next year. And you can't talk about Tesla without talking about their gigafactories. Tesla Gigafactory Berlin is underway after a precarious start. The construction was under a tight deadline to cut down all the trees at the former tree plantation where the gigafactory is now being built. This was to make sure that bird nesting would not be impacted. So before all the birds came, they needed to clear all the trees and they were actually able to do that um, just days ahead of that deadline. And Tesla Gigafactory in Shanghai is back up and running despite current affairs due to many safety measures that they're taking at the plant. Also, more construction at Gigafactory Shanghai on another large building right next to the existing Model 3 factory. So we don't know exactly where they're going to be building in that uh, new building that they're working on, but the best conjecture at this point is Model Y in China. And according to YouTuber Wuba, Giga Shanghai is reportedly now pumping out 3,000 Model 3s per week. But Tesla had to reduce its workforce in Gigafactory Nevada by roughly 75%. Panasonic has already stopped production on their side of the factory. And Tesla's Fremont factory has been shut down due to current events. And obviously during this crisis, there is a drop in demand worldwide for things like automobiles and Tesla has been feeling this as well. According to an email from Tesla's director of Northern Europe, Axel Tengen, he said that they'll be having to furlough some employees uh, during the month of April until things start to pick up again. Now, luckily, Tesla is well positioned in terms of cash. They just did a cash raise uh, a couple months ago, and they've got about eight or nine billion dollars in cash, which many analysts say can keep them running for at least five quarters, even if everything got completely shut down. So at least we can end on some good news. That was our brief Tesla update. Thank you so much, Marcus, for having us on the channel. And if you're interested in more Tesla and sustainability news, come join us on Tesla Time News every every Monday over on Now You Know. Thanks so much for having us, Marcus. Now, now you know. know. Well, thanks, Zach and Jesse. That is an awesome rundown. I can't wait to take a ride in one of these Model Ys. Still a quite long way off for us in Australia, being that we're right-hand drive and all, but hopefully we'll get a chance to experience that soon. If it's anything like a Model 3, it's going to be an incredible ride. If you want to check out more from Zach and Jesse on Now You Know, there's a link popping up here in the top right. And of course, there is also a link down in the description. Now, early in the week, I discovered this brand new Starship user's guide dated March of 2020. Now, I'm not going to go too in-depth here, but there is certainly some interesting information here. Some of it quite mind-blowing, actually. Now, I've talked a lot about the header tanks in the current Starship prototypes and how this is all very likely only temporary. SpaceX will be wanting that space for payload capacity, as we've seen with previous mock-ups. In this design, as an example, the Starship can deploy huge payloads by opening right up like a clamshell. Now, this document had reconfirmed that direction, which is just awesome. The guide here says that the Starship payload fairing is a clamshell structure in which the payload is integrated. Once integrated, the clamshell fairing remains closed through launch up until the payload is ready to deploy. When the payload is ready for deployment in orbit, the clamshell fairing door just opens up and the payload adapter and the payload are tilted at an angle in preparation for separation. The payload is then separated using the mission unique payload adapter. Now, once separation is confirmed and the payloads have cleared the fairing, the payload fairing door is then just closed in preparation 
preparation for Starship's return to Earth. Now this is going to be incredible and it just goes to show that the versatility of Starship is going to be quite profound. There will be a crew transport version of the ship, refueling version of the ship as well as this variety making massive payload deployments possible. With a fully reusable system this is all going to change everything. Now Tim Dodd the everyday astronaut and of course many others picked up the same information from this new document that raised some interesting questions. Here Tim queried Elon directly on Twitter on the payload capabilities to low Earth orbit to which Elon replied quite quickly saying that the mass of initial SN ships will be a little high and the ISP a little low but over time it will be around 150 tonnes to low Earth orbit while being fully reusable. So wait 150 tonnes that is much higher than we've been expecting. In the past we've been expecting that it would perhaps be just a little over 100 tonnes as we've seen from the website. Even still actually the website is showing this. But 150 tonnes is a huge increase to what we thought would be possible. Based on simulations on known statistics we can only assume that there is quite significant improvements to the Raptor engine efficiency as well as perhaps the build techniques and materials that is being used on future versions of the Starship. Let's just assume for a minute SpaceX could utilise this entire payload capacity for a bunch of Starlink satellites. At around 260 kilograms per satellite that could deploy a whopping number of them at around 570 or so per launch. That is just crazy stuff right there. Another shout out here to Lab Padre who this week has finalised that new camera setup. Now you can go to check out footage quality right up to 4K so that is really taking it to the next level. Amazing work there mate. If you want to check out that live stream footage there is a link to the channel in the description. Now just quickly a huge thank you to my amazing patrons here. You are all quite literally turning this dream of mine of creating content from a hobby into something much more significant. If you like what I do and you would like to join our awesome patrons here head to patreon.com slash Marcus House. You can interact with me more directly via the included exclusive roles in Discord. You can check out some exclusive patron only content and you can also have your name listed right here like these other incredible people. A massive thank you as well to my quality control squad here here for helping me research and proof the material for these videos. If you're interested in these topics and would like to be part of this, follow me on Twitter and please do get in touch. In the tile in the bottom left today we have my video last week talking Starship and Dragon XL. In the top right is my latest video and in the bottom right content that YouTube has selected from my channel just for you. Thank you everyone for watching and we'll see you all in the next video.